I don't want to sort of just sort of drone on and on today. So I really want today, this afternoon, our workshop to be really driven by the clinical realities that all of you are dealing with in your roles and in your uh, respective institutions and so forth. So um, I'm kind of thinking about the next couple of hours. Um, um, for those of you, if, uh, does anybody in here do uh, multifamily groups or run groups with families? Okay, so some of you. So one of the principles of multifamily group therapy, okay, is the idea that the clinician is sort of really trying to harness resources and insight and perspective and these kinds of things that's actually already in the group, okay? And so as a clinician, what you do is you try to, try to point out that when one family is having a crisis, you might sort of say, hey, you know, this sounds a lot like what the Smith family went through a couple of weeks ago. Can you sort of talk us through what that, you try to point out commonality. So it's sort of with that kind of overarching sort of framework that I'd like this afternoon's workshop to sort of be structured. So if you have particular expertise or specific experiences that sort of, you know, align with some of the things that we're talking about, I really, really hope that you sort of share that, not only for my own knowledge and uh, benefit, but for the benefit of everybody else in the room as well, okay? So, um, workshop goals. We're gonna sort of try to continue our conversation from uh, this morning, taking what we know from longitudinal studies of ADHD trajectories, sort of who gets better, who gets worse, et cetera, and take that literature in terms of what predicts those differences, what mediates that, we'll talk about what that uh, means in just a second, and what moderates that, and we'll have that conversation uh, going forward. Um, the content that I sort of developed for the workshop today was uh, to try to prioritize sort of transdiagnostic and modifiable targets, right? So if I said that socioeconomic status was a correlate or a predictor of individual differences in ADHD, that's probably not going to be that useful to you, right? <clears throat> Unless some of you are able to sort of directly address that somehow magically. Um, but rather sort of transdiagnostic processes that underlie or predict not only ADHD, but some of these other functional domains, clinical domains, and et cetera, that um, we know are associated with, uh, with ADHD, okay? Um, the good news is that we know that there are interventions available that can reduce ADHD and related problems, and some of those common ingredients are gonna be sort of what we uh, review this afternoon together. And sort of in a similar vein, what we're really trying to do is, <clears throat> what I've tried to do is sort of distill out from all these sort of like protocols like the Incredible Years or Triple P or you know, uh, uh, behavioral parent training and so forth, and try to distill from all these different packages, right, these sort of name brand packages, try to distill down what are the common elements among them, right? So if the Incredible Years and Triple P and all these other interventions are effective, well, what's common among them and why not prioritize that? So that's what we're really trying to do uh, today. <clears throat> So with that in mind, so the, the workshop's gonna be organized around two sort of assertions, or, or, or uh, we'll go over those individually now. <clears throat> the first premise is related to, <clears throat> or reflects <clears throat> my assessment that the relational context of ADHD is absolutely central to its development, its you know, longitudinal trajectories and these kinds of things. Relational broadly defined, okay? So parent-child relationships is what we're gonna really focus on today but relational aspects in general. <clears throat> the second premise is emotional difficulties, sort of broadly defined, I believe are under-recognized in ADHD, yet also predictive of outcomes. And so we're gonna talk about trait negative affect in kids and what are some intervention targets um, that sort of um, follow from that. So again, the content for today is sort of curated around two basic assertions. The first is that the relational context of ADHD is absolutely critical to address and intervene with, specifically as it relates to the parent-child relationship. So that's sort of like focus area number one. And then the second one will be sort of emotional difficulties. What do they look like and how, I, how, how might we incorporate them in terms of our interventions? <clears throat> Okay, so let's start first off with a rationale in the context of ADHD specifically for parent training. So in other words, why are parents the central focus of treatments for ADHD? And if you sort of skip down to the bottom, I don't know if any of you have had this experience, I certainly have many times, <clears throat> in working with families, parents will often say, um, well, you know, we came here to sort of address our child's ADHD, like why are you spending all your time with me, right? Like, he's the one you guys are, should be wor worried about, or she should be the one you're worried about. <clears throat> so 
So why are the parents, and I'll, we'll talk a little bit about some strategies I think to sort of handle that. So why are parents the central focus for child ADHD? Well, we know from the literature that on average parents of kids with ADHD report higher levels of stress, okay? higher levels of their own psychopathology, depression, and ADHD in particular, and also are observed in the lab and self-report that they use more uh, uh, poor parenting skills, so inconsistent discipline, things like that. Another key rationale for why parents and the parent-child relationships and parenting behavior ought to be sort of prioritized is that we know a lot about what's called child effects, and we're gonna unpack that in just a little bit. Uh, we know parenting predicts the long-term course. We talked a little bit that, about that this morning. And we also know that parenting significantly mediates long-term outcomes secondary to intervention. So what does that mean? In English, that means when treatments work for ADHD, one of the ingredients of that change, that therapeutic change, is reductions in negative parenting or improvements in positive parenting, okay? So if you have effective treatments over here and improvements in child outcome over here, we don't know how or why it worked, we just know that it did. But studies that sort of break that apart, they're sometimes called dismantling studies. Actually, Bill Pelham, who was just here a second ago, has pioneered a lot of that work. When you break apart effective treatments, what you find is that parenting behavior and aspects of the parent-child relationship are really the kind of, one of the key mechanisms of action. Okay. <clears throat> to the final point here um, around the etiology of ADHD and why, versus sort of why parenting as a treatment goal is sort of separable. So I'll have parents say to me, I read that ADHD is mostly heritable, so why are you talking to me, right? <clears throat> so I think especially early on in treatment, I think you have an opportunity to sort of frame changes in parenting that you're gonna sort of help the families with as an opportunity to enact behavioral change, okay? So when we talk about psychoeducation, which is really one of these sort of common ingredients across these effective interventions, I think when you think about psychoeducation, you really wanna sort of be active in framing for the parent that even though liability or susceptibility to ADHD is significantly genetic, parenting factors play a huge role in terms of the development of ADHD over time. Who develops comorbid disorders and who doesn't? Who's functionally impaired as a result of those symptoms and, and so forth, okay? So I think part of what you wanna do in terms of developing a rationale, getting parent buy-in and so forth, is to sort of frame the changes in parenting that you're gonna work with the family on as an opportunity to sort of change the child's behavior. <clears throat> One other way to sort of frame the child, uh, frame sort of parent buy-in and, and so forth around the kind of the, the sort of central focus of parenting is if <clears throat> your psychoeducation isn't sort of working sort of directly, do what I do, which is sort of quote Harry Potter. <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, Albus, Dumbledore, Albus Dumbledore says in Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone at a couple of different marks, referring to parenting and parent-child relationships, right? That love as powerful as your mother's for you leaves its own mark, but there's no visible sign, right? And that to have been loved so deeply will, to, will give some protection forever, right? So part of what I think uh, sort of parenting-focused interventions is about in the beginning is trying to sort of harness that sort of motivation for change, okay? And helping parents sort of see changes in their parenting behavior right, as being a key way to sort of enact that change, okay. <clears throat> All right, so I think this is my only Harry Potter slide, so we'll say, say sorry, I know. <clears throat> well, that was pretty good to incorporate Harry Potter at least once. Um, okay, so another sort of slight variation on this sort of, again, relational context is sort of what, what I'm calling of ADHD being really central to, um, uh, to intervention and, again, uh, long-term outcome and so forth is, um, work by Sunia Luthar, who's sort of one of these uh, giants in the field of child development and uh, resilience. <clears throat> and she has a quote, she says it all the time, that resilience or improved functioning or optimal functioning rests fundamentally on relationships. Okay? And again, here you again, you have this opportunity to frame for parents that to promote resilience, you know, improved outcomes, we know there's heterogeneity and these kinds of things, that it really comes down centrally to, to relationships. And it's not just about your genes and not just about risk factors and things like that. <clears throat> okay, so we can actually, oh, I have something else at least here. Um, <clears throat> Calvin and Hobbes, so who Calvin asks incredulously, uh, what assurance do I have that your parent isn't, parenting isn't screwing me up, right? So we wanna sort of harness for parents this sort of degree of motivation about sort of how can we improve child outcome. Here's an empirical example of how relational context is really central to the development of something like depression. Okay, which we talked a little bit about this morning. 
So this is a paper from my group, um, first author Kate Humphreys, who's now a professor at Vanderbilt, on Journal of Abnormal Psychology. And we were interested in understanding, not just describing that depression is common in ADHD. We know that already. Right? But what we're interested in doing was to sort of understand how and why and what happens, like sort of what happens in between the ADHD and the depression that sort of is conducive to the development of depression. So we did this study with um, uh, my colleague, uh, Connie Hammond, a big figure in the depression literature. And we used two different studies. We used an ADHD study, which is the data presented here. And then our second study, which is uh, her study of offspring of depressed mothers in Australia who were followed from early childhood to uh, late adolescence. And so we're trying to understand in this particular model is, OK, ADHD is related to depression, it predicts future depression, et cetera. So, we were influenced by the interpersonal model of depression, right? Which is, again, social and interpersonal relationships are really central to understanding the development of depression, and that would also be true for ADHD, okay? And so what we did in this model, I'm not gonna bore you with the specific sort of, you know, statistics of it and so forth, but what we found is that parent-child relationship problems and peer relationship problems each explain the development of depression from ADHD. Okay. So this is a model known as the dual failure model, right, where you have early ADHD problems and inattention and, you know, early conduct problems. And what, we're, what the model told us in both samples is that what happens is that early ADHD problems, okay, can catalyze and contribute to parent-child relationship problems and peer problems. And it's sort of failure in two domains, hence dual failure, right, that then contributes to the development of depression. Now another piece of the model that we evaluated that didn't work here, but has been reported in the literature, as far as another sort of a developmental failure, would be sort of academic problems, right? So early ADHD contributes to peer problems, to academic problems, and to parent-child relationship problems. And that those domains might then kind of almost like conspire to, right, the development of, of depressed mood. Um, I have a question. Yes, please. Yes. So the, we, had, we basically found the same findings in both studies. So in this first study, it was based on children, some of who were medicated, some of who were not. But we didn't control any of that. Those families did whatever they wanted to do and, and, and so forth. In the other study, um, there were some kids and adolescents who were on antidepressant medications because it was a study more about depression more so than ADHD. But both studies were similar in terms of the study wasn't providing depression, wasn't controlling, you get it, you don't get it, and things like that. So it was sort of built into the, the sort of phenomenology of ADHD and depression already. I have a personal experience yeah. with my own child. Yes. I'm not a psychologist. Yes. I'm an educator and a mother. Okay. I'm working as a mother. Sure. I have a child with ADHD, and he was medicated, and then um, we stopped the medication for some reason. He changed the behavior during uh, his teenage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not academic, yeah. but I use a lot of positive reinforcement uh -huh. because I use a lot of um, therapy, cognitive therapy, and I use a lot of established routine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very firm. Right. So it's, it's to the point that relationship uh, that you mentioned, parental mm -hmm. problem, I mean, it was addressed because I look for help as a mother. I'm yes. As a mother. Sure, sure. But uh, if the parents, Yes, I'm yes. Not, I'm working in the educational field. Yeah. But I know that not all the parents, they know how to deal yep. with the misbehavior or right. this type of, of behavior. Right. So I think that's it's, it's in line with a lot of interventions that talk about parents as either coaches or as teachers or as, you know, uh, things like that. And so that's yet another reason why intervening with parents, right, even though we know parents don't cause ADHD, is such a powerful mechanism of change from all these different intervention studies is because the, for parents sort of helping sort of manage some of these parent-child relationship problems, instituting some structure and consistency, which we know helps with ADHD kinds of behaviors and so forth, that's yet another reason why sort of getting parent buy-in and really sort of using or leveraging sort of parenting, parent behavior, and parent-child relationship factors is really critical to sort of improving functioning over time among, among people with uh, kids with ADHD. Yeah. Yeah. He's in college. That's, and he's in regular classes. That's right. He doesn't have any IEP, nothing. 
Yeah. So as you'll see when we talk about some of these, as I mentioned before, what are the common ingredients to effective treatments for ADHD and disruptive behavior problems, you'll see sort of really socializing is a term that I use a lot, parents around how to measure things, what to look for, defining the scope of problems and things. Things that I think oftentimes as clinically trained folks, such as everybody here, um, sort of almost take for granted, but that sort of parents oftentimes need some help, some language, some way of understanding uh, about how to go about doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Is there ever been a study in which they looked at the predictors of parenting prior to them being parents? Like, have they always had a level of stress, even adolescence as a parent, yep. prior to them actually having children? And then also the, the hierarchy of, of number of children, like having one child versus multiple children. Yeah, so let's take the first question first, if I could. So people have certainly looked at, and this is it will be a nice uh, segue into, it's coming up pretty soon. Um, a discussion we'll have about uh, child effects, um, which is parent personality traits, for example, especially negative emotionality, or sometimes if you are familiar with the five factor model and personality, neuroticism, right, plays a role in terms of people both contributing kind of unintentionally to generating their own stress, but also to responding to stressors in a perhaps a semi kind of exaggerated kind of way. So, sort of negative emotionality or neuroticism can play a role in terms of just how stressful parent-child relationships can be if you have a child who's hyperactive and, 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 and or inattentive. I don't know, sorry, give me one second, then we'll come right over to you, thank you. Um, the question about sort of the number of kids and things like that, but as we'll talk about with child effects, there's work showing, for example, that having a child with, or couples, I believe, um, who have uh, children with ADHD, right? That AD, the child's ADHD contributes to marital satisfaction and sort of marital dissolution, even if you control for their initial levels of how satisfied they were as, uh, uh, as, as couples and so forth. So definitely kind of understanding sort of parents in terms of their reactivity, their sort of inclination to sort of stress, stress generation, their response to stress and so forth could be an important part of your kind of like treatment development as well. Yeah, there's a question up there. Yes. Yeah, those, these are just the measures we use so to estimate attention. It's, a, it's, a, it's an interview. It's basically, a, it's, it's basically saying we measured inattention from the disc, which is a structured interview with the parent, and then we measured inattention symptoms from uh, half the symptoms were from uh, DBD1 and DBD2, and that uh, is uh, Bill Pelham's disruptive behavior disorder rating scale measure that we use. So it's just sort of that circle, not to get overly statistical is just a, it's sort of the, we call it a latent construct. It's sort of the latent construct represented sort of underlying the, when you ask parents about inattention this way, you ask parents about inattention a slightly different way. It's just sort of the, the, the latent factor, okay? So again, the idea here is that through peer problems, okay, and through sort of conflictual parent-child relationship problems, you have the development of, of depression, okay? And that was evident not just in our study of ADHD kids, but also of uh, offspring of depressed mothers as well. Okay, um, so I think what I'm we're sort of starting to veer toward, right, is this notion of development being dynamic and interactive, okay? So to understand individual differences, we always need to understand sort of positive or negative traits. C1, you can just think of the child at time one, today, tomorrow, what are the, the child's traits tomorrow, the next day, and so forth. And the context, it could be parenting, it could be peer relationships, it could be teacher environment, it could be neighborhood kids, what have you. But they're always sort of reciprocally, and then we use the term transactionally over time, influencing each other. Okay? So really thinking about sort of context, the relationship context for today at least, as being really central to, to ADHD. Okay, so why should parenting be prioritized um, even though it doesn't cause the thing that we're trying to improve, child ADHD? Okay? So, there's a, a couple sort of lines of evidence to suggest why. That we know, first of all, there's naturally occurring differences in parenting behavior, okay? Just sort of naturally in, in the way that people vary in height and IQ and these kinds of things. Uh, parents vary with respect to their parenting behavior, okay? And what's most important is that study after study has shown for decades now that sort of when parenting and parent-child relationships are disrupted, okay? 
whether they're disrupted by low socioeconomic status, whether they're disrupted because of parent alcohol problems, whether parenting is disrupted because of marital conflict, whether parenting is disrupted because of maternal depression. It's almost like across all these different scenarios, you sort of look under the hood of the car and parent-child relationship problems, parenting behavior is oftentimes sort of one of the prime candidates there. So in other words, parenting behavior sort of if you go, and I think I have a slide here. Yes, wow, organize it reasonably well. When we talked this morning about this watershed model, you have these different risk, risk factors. Parents drink too much, parents are sad, low socioeconomic status, you know, chronic unemployment. You have all these different risk factors, okay? But using this sort of watershed model, what we're seeing is that parenting behavior and parent-child relationship factors are a common pathway through which those different risk factors are contributing to how well kids with ADHD are doing with respect to their ADHD, with respect to their depression, with respect to other aspects of their functioning. Bless you, okay? So my goal in today is to sort of help, sort of equip you with sort of some resources and some perspectives in a way that you could sort of uh, uh, use in your own practice around sort of uh, motivating uh, uh, parenting behavior. Um, so here's a study that we did, um, uh, I, I mentioned earlier today, but this is an example of how parenting is again a mediator. So you have early parental ADHD here, you have later child ADHD, and that association over time, across seven to eight years, was partially explained by negative parenting. So said a slightly different way. So if I told you that parents' ADHD symptoms and their kids' ADHD symptoms were related, you'd be like, of course they are, right? And you might say like, oh, it's because they share the same genes, right? 50% of the same genes. And you wouldn't be wrong. But what this study is telling us is that separate from that, when parents have elevated ADHD symptoms, they tend to use more negative, inconsistent kinds of parenting strategies. And what does that do? It tends to increase or accelerate their child's ADHD symptoms, right? So when you see parent is similar to the child, we can't always assume that's because of shared genes. It could be because this is putting forth into motion disruptions in here that are then in, what, in turn doing what? Sort of escalating these, okay? So again, parenting behavior really being a common pathway from these different risk factors. We have parental ADHD, but you have all those other risk factors we just talked about here, right? Parenting behavior is always there. Okay. Yeah, please. Thank you. Yes. Is it the case that negative child behavior predicts poor parenting practices? And is that modeled in oh, what you are yes. sharing with us? Yes, sir, it is, and um, it's coming out here. We go. It's, it's, it's like three slides away. I can wait. You, thank you, Steve. <laughs> you, have, you have lovely inhibitory control. Thank you very much. Um, we refer to that as child effects, and that's literally like just, just on the horizon. He does, you do, <laughs> exactly. Um, but very effective, so thank you. Um, and I will have an opportunity, as I try to do oftentimes, which is to go over or to present um, what is probably for me my favorite study in the history of abnormal psychology, and it's re uh, related to this topic of child effects. Okay, so let's talk about, I don't think I skipped, okay, yeah. Let's talk about behavioral parent training, okay? So behavioral parent training has a number of different elements, okay, and as it suggests, right, you're trying to sort of change and alter things around the child's learning environment, family environment, and so forth, uh, attending to sort of uh, behavioral principles, okay? Now, even though behavioral parent training is a very specific sort of type of intervention, okay, as I mentioned at the outset, what I'm trying to do today is to sort of to distill out from all these different effective interventions what are sort of the common best practices among them and sort of, prevent kind of present kind of a unified sort of characterization that way, okay? So one of the kind of foundational arms of the treatment of behavioral parent training is psychoeducation, okay? And so, in a lot of different sort of conceptual models for treatment, psychoeducation is oftentimes sort of the first arm, and I would argue it's among the most important sort of arms in terms of it really sets the frame, clinically speaking, okay, for your family that you're working with. 
So psychoeducation for families probably, and again, please, for those of you who do it, I hope that many of you do, share some of your tricks, your tools of the trade, little sayings, little examples, little analogies, and things like that, would be uh, wonderful to hear from you. So the kinds of things that we're trying to do under this sort of large category of psychoeducation for families is to socialize parents that behaviors are multiply determined, okay? Especially in the presence of sort of negative affect or stress or arousal, right? There's a tendency to a sort of attribute negative behavior to he's doing it on purpose, she's doing it on purpose, and so forth. What psychoeducation should partly be trying to do is to help parents understand that the behaviors that they're concerned about are multiply determined. And because of that, that they need to have a diversity of tools in their toolbox. Okay? And then that's part of what you're trying to do with them. Right? You can't just sort of you know, treat ADHD with simply a, whatever, a tape measure and a, and a hammer. Right? You need a number of different tools. And part of what behavioral parent training and these other interventions are trying to do is to equip parents with these different tools and, of course, then help them understand when to use what, how to evaluate that, and so forth. Okay? Another thing that psychoeducation tries to do is to try to develop for yourself as the clinician and the family, the parents, a common language and framework to understand behavior. Okay? And so that you know, one common sort of uh, uh, framework that's uh, used a lot in behavioral parent training, but in other treatments as well, is talking about the ABCs of behavior, okay? So the ABCs correspond to the antecedent or the an antecedents, okay? B for behavior, C for consequences. So really, again, helping socialize parents around, not just sort of attending like, oh, you know, um, you know, she, uh, you, know, you know, my daughter sort of um, impulsively did something, right? It's to sort of help parents kind of develop a kind of way of understanding behavior, like, okay, she did do that. What happened before, that's the antecedent part, right? Was there a trigger? Was there a provocation of some kind? And what was the consequence? How did I respond? How did her dad respond? How did the environment respond to that, right? So it's, again, giving parents some sort of tools around with which to understand behavior and not simply, hopefully, just to react somewhat kind of impulsively, perhaps, to that especially negative behavior, okay? So that way, in sessions, as you go forward and you're evaluating which interventions are working and which ones are not, you guys have a common language to talk about, well, okay, these were the behaviors that were problematic for the week. Well, what, what do you know as far, what did you notice, if anything, about what preceded that? Did she seem frustrated? And, and then we can start sort of tinkering with some of the interventions. So overall, when I sort of do work in this domain, I sort of try to get parents to buy into these roles of being both an investigator and being a technician, okay? The investigator part is like, you know, help the parent sort of identify a kind of an identity with being an investigator, which, which, we, which means what? It can include things such as helping the parents develop hypotheses for why that behavior happened, not just respond to that behavior, okay? Socialize parents around gathering information. How often do those behaviors happen? This week versus last week, for example. Help parents evaluate their interventions, what worked, what contributed to it not working, perhaps, and helping them think about implementation, right? You can have all these behavior parent training principles as we're gonna talk about, but implementation of them oftentimes is, is tricky as we all know. And then what about parent as a technician? Parent as a technician, that role is I'm trying to help the parent sort of become more fluent in acquiring these skills and practicing these skills, troubleshooting, the, troubleshooting them, because we know sometimes they're not gonna work. They come back next week, and you're gonna sort of have to tinker with them. So behavioral parent training, especially for the psychoeducation, again, is trying to really set the frame for the work that's going to be done in the weeks and sessions ahead. Okay? All right. So let's talk about some sample education, uh, psychoeducation content. Though I've been talking mostly about principles. So what are some things that you might do? So these are some things that I include, but again, please, um, would love to hear what, what kinds of conversations you guys have with your families as well. So one of the things that psychoeducation should be doing is to assess and frame expectations and potentially reframe expectations, okay? I think especially for psychoeducation early in treatment, you want to assess what is the parent expecting about treatment, okay? What is treatment going to look like? 
And one big expectation that I will sort of uh, frequently assess is what are their expectations about how quickly their child's behavior is likely to in in improve. Okay? And that relates to one principle that I often use in psychoeducation, which is known as an extinction burst. Right? So an extinction burst refers to an increase in behavior when a reinforcer is removed. Okay? We've all seen this. We all do it. Um, when I was at LAX yesterday, I saw uh, maybe about a three or four year old who was on an iPad and uh, she was trying to press whatever button or icon to, to do whatever she was doing. And so we're all reinforced, right, when we look at our phones and we touch an icon. When we touch an icon, what is it that we expect that happens? It opens, something happens, something happens, right? Okay, so we all get reinforced for that. We've all been reinforced when you press on, I don't know, Facebook something good or bad, who knows, we're all, we're all reinforced, right? So what happens when that reinforcer or that reinforcement is <laughs> cut off? So I'll tell you what happened in that LAX example, right? <laughs> Does anybody want to guess? Exactly, right? Can you do that for everybody, please? Da, 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 da. That's the burst of behavior that we were talking about, right? So let me ask you guys, why might, given that you now know about extinction burst, why might that be relevant in the context of psychoeducation and framing expectations and reframing expectations for families, for parents? Parents might feel like the intervention that they're doing is ineffective because the, the behavior will escalate So let's say the child in question has been reinforced with attention unintentionally by parents and so forth for their negative behavior. Okay, they come to see you, you've done some psychoed, you're going to start implementing some interventions, and you're going to start to try and change right, the reinforcement schedule. Right? What behavior gets reinforced with that? So using that iPad example, right, if the child's negative behavior has traditionally been reinforced with attention from the parent, and then attention from the parent's no longer coming from his or her behavior, what's going to happen to that behavior? It's going to be this. So I can't tell you how many times I've had families come back, like literally after the second session of trying this, doc, something, I must have like misheard you or like, you know, like, like return to sender, like something's wrong here, right? This can't be right. So I use this extinction burst example, I use the iPad example a lot, to sort of frame for families that when you start reconstituting reinforcers in the, in the home and at school and so forth, typically things are going to get worse before they get better. And so that if you do that early before in some anticipation of that, then that helps frame for the parents, there's going to be some heavy lifting that's going to have to be done, especially in the beginning, and you're going to have to endure some, perhaps some difficulty because of the burst of negative behavior. Yeah, in the back. Hi, how are you? Hi, good, how are you? I'm good, thanks. Um, I always like to um, give the parents an example so that they can kind of see it in um, maybe something they've done, like a soda machine. Oh, you're, yeah. You're putting yeah. the, my second one, yeah. The, the dollar in the soda machine, it eats your money, yeah. or it's you not coming me, out. You see me if I don't get my Doritos or whatever, <laughs> like I, I burst pretty hard. That's so right. you start yeah. hitting the machine. Oh, yeah, for sure. And the behavior escalates, escalates, and then sometimes you know, you walk away, then you say, let me just try one more time. And you come back and you hit the machine again. Exactly. So that they can kind of see it from a different, not just the child's behavior, exactly. but their own behavior, how right. that happens in natural settings with That's themselves. Right. And then if you sort of fast forward that just a tiny bit for families who might inconsistently use these strategies and so forth, right? Maybe that contributes to some escalation of the behavior as well, right? So the child, you know, uh, it's pressing the iPad button, sort of, and it gets reinforced. You stop that, the child bursts even more, right? And then there's some sort of, you know, tapering, and then the behavior comes back, the reinforcement comes back. The child may be learning that he or she needs to what? Escalate to make sure that the reinforcement is sort of, stays with them, you know, sort of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. In response to that, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. So you know, you know, this comes up in the context of like, well, you know, I've 
Oh, parent training, you know, I've heard of this before. I did it a couple years ago, you know, and it didn't work and so forth. So again, when things like that come up, this is some of what you have available to you, again, in terms of sort of framing and reframing expectations and so forth, yeah. I mean, the principles are, to me, are, are, are the same. I think any parent, parent figures, yeah. you know, like, uh, I don't know, extended family who might be living, adult caregivers in the house, I think you want to sort of have uh, the sort of principles be as sort of faithfully sort of adhered to by as many adults who sort of interact with the child as possible. So if you can get buy-in, meaning both parents coming in to, to training, you know, for, for these sessions, then I think that's, that, so that, that's fantastic. Correct, correct, exactly, that's right. Because in a family systems perspective, as long as everybody has a relationship with the child, dad with kid, mom with kid, and so forth, they're all influencing the child in this sort of reciprocal kind of way and so forth. So the last thing you want to do, right, is have undoing or sort of, you know, these inconsistent sort of uh, reinforcement schedules that can sort of make things even more complicated, yeah. Um, okay, here we are at child effects. Well, this is the, the, the beginning of child effects, okay. So another sort of sample point of emphasis in the psychoeducation is around why you focus on parenting for childhood ADHD is that, yes, absolutely, we know that child factors, like their ADHD, like their IQ, like their verbal ability, like their temperament, these kinds of things, can and do elicit differences from the environment, okay? So in other words, Parenting a child who's highly conscientious and very verbal and eager to please and things like that, let's be honest, that's different than a child who's very impulsive and disruptive, at least potentially, right? So we know that in the environment, parents in particular are highly susceptible to child effects, okay? So that when the child is hyperactive and impulsive and disruptive and so forth, okay, that their negative behavior can tend to elicit more negative behavior from the parents in terms of their parenting or other parent behaviors in general. And I have an, a, an empirical example of that coming up. So we wanna talk about, again, it's not just sort of parenting and the child, but the child affects the parent as well. And as a result, we sort of wanna, again, almost like fortify or sort of strengthen or really equip the parent to be able to sort of um, effectively in a well-regulated kind of way manage and still be able to sort of implement these interventions in a, in, in a uh, consistent kind of way. Another way we might think about child effects, and again, these are things that are available to you, is to talk about sort of goodness of fit, okay? And that, again, in terms of trying to get parental buy-in and so forth, you might talk about how the child's temperament, the child's behavior and so forth, while you know, clearly problematic and challenging at times, right, that sometimes if that sort of match, depending on the environment, that actually can improve, improve outcomes. So we saw, we refer to this as so for example, the similarity, similarity fit hypothesis, this is a paper from Charlotte Johnston uh, up in Vancouver showing that actually when child ADHDs are sort of, child ADHD symptoms are sort of accompanied by or coupled with parental ADHD symptoms, they actually do a little bit better, more so than when you have a highly dissonant type of parent-child relationship where you have high ADHD symptoms in the child, but low ADHD symptoms in the parent. Okay, so it's not, what we're trying to do is to get away from these sort of like, when the child's like this, it's like this. It's sort of these configurations, right, of the parent-child relationship, not just the child is about, has this characteristic or, or these particular qualities. Um, another key part of psychoeducation um, uh, might address things around parental self-care, right? So that, let me see, I think I have this in the next, right, so this is an analogy that I borrowed from, um, Andrea Cronus, uh, a well-known ADHD researcher who often sort of refers to this as that, as to why parents must engage in self-care, is that on an airplane, right, when you talk about the, the oxygen masks, what do they always tell the parents or adults who have kids with them? Put on your mask first, right? Because if you don't have your mask on, there's nothing, not nothing, but you're gonna be severely limited in terms of what you can do for your child, okay? So part of what you might do in psychoeducation is finding out what they do for self-care in terms of stress reduction and coping and these kinds of things. Does that directly in a kind of a very linear way relate to the child's ADHD symptoms? Maybe not, right? But it's part of this sort of relational context, strengthening the, strengthening the parent's ability to sort of withstand some of those, those child effects from negative behavior and so forth, okay? 
So this is a, an amusing meme. Um, you're making it difficult for me to be the parent I always imagined I would be, right? Like, let's be honest, that's sort of the reality. This is what we're talking about, right? And that if this is your child or your client that you're working with who has the kinds of difficulties that we've been talking about, we need to support mom, dad, family to sort of be able to do the things that we've been talking about, okay? Including self-care. Okay. Um, this is the study that I was uh, talking to you about. Bill, does this study look familiar? Oh. <laughs> this is, uh, Bill, this is, this is my favorite. The only person who read that study. No, no, no. I, you know how many times I talk about this study and, so let me talk you through it. Um, I saw Charlotte last summer and we were talking about this study too. Um, so this is a wonderful experimental example of child effects, among other things. So this was in 1989, that was 30 years ago, this paper in the Journal of Abnormal Psych, I think, in which they're essentially thinking about the following phenomena, which we know is true, right? That parent alcohol substance use problems, things in that space, are positively correlated with child behavior problems. Okay, that's probably not that surprising, not that controversial, right? What's potentially controversial about that is that we don't know what the direction of the effects are, even if there are direct effects. So one directional explanation would be what? Parental alcohol and substance use, right, might, who knows, affect their parenting, and then child behavior problems develop. What would be the reverse explanation? The parents develop alcohol and substance problems partially in response <laughs> to this. Or maybe the answer is both, right? So what um, Lang and Bill and et cetera did in this study was that very cleverly sort of took 32 Florida State, I think that's right, right, college undergrads, 16 men, 16 women, and they were randomly assigned, so they later flipped the coin or something equivalent to that. So 16 of those college students interacted with a child who was trained to be I'm going to be very nice and assume that that child was trained to be like all of you and me when we were kids. Right? Compliant, pro-social, eager to please, and so forth. Anybody want to guess the kind of child who the other 16 college students got randomly assigned to? Tasmina, we, we all know, the sort of ADHD conduct disorder-y kind of child. Okay? All right. So you have random assignment now, right? This is sort of what I was talking about in my talk earlier this morning. So any differences between the 16 college students who interacted with the compliant child and the 16 college students who interacted with the non-compliant child are going to be different, or whatever differences are, they're going to be random. So but that's, that's okay. All right, so then they were observed for a while, these college students interacting with the child, one of the two types of childs and so forth. And then there was a post-interaction stimulus where basically the 32 college students had an opportunity to drink as much alcohol as they wanted to. <laughs> right? And um, afterwards, or sort of before the, 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 the um, opportunity to drink, they were told that they were going to interact with that child again. So the nice kid, or half of them, and, the nice kid. and then they were said, you can drink as much. They're like, oh, well, I believe there was in the method section, right, Bill, was something about like, um, they were told, the college students, they were told like they would be given a, a ride home afterwards and so forth. And of course, they standardized how much alcohol was available so that when the study was over, how did the study end? So after they had the opportunity to drink alcohol, they were basically said, okay, the, the child had to go home or something like that. The study's over, we'll drive you home or something. And then they could measure exactly how much alcohol was consumed. So let's look at the findings. So let's see if I get this right. So the top half of the panel the outcome they're looking at is how much beer was consumed in milliliters. Okay. The bottom half of the panel is their blood alcohol level, so another you know, phenotype that you think would be related to that. Then, here are the two types of kids, right? This is sort of disruptive Tasmanian devil example, of, and sort of typically developing kids, right? And how much beer was consumed. And remember, there's 16 females and uh, 16 men. So this is the amount of beer consumed by the female undergraduates who had to interact with the tough kid. And then the average amount of beer the same female undergrads had to drink with who? The typically developing kid. Okay? So the mean differences aren't 
that different, 585 to 569. But what do you notice about the standard deviation? It's a lot larger. There's more variability going on here. Okay? So that's females. How about for men or male undergraduate students? About one and a half times more. Okay? And blood alcohol level, as you sort of would expect, sort of similar results. Now, this is an example of child effects, right? So you're taking college undergrad students who've never met this kid of type 1 and kid of type 2 who spend a measly, what, not even a half hour with the child, right? <laughs> 18 minutes, I believe. And you can experimentally elicit differences in what? How much people drink. So this is not about parenting behavior. This is just behavior that parents do in general, right? very reliably this way, okay? So this is an example of child effects, right? That literally eight, now we can't assume it's linear, right? That spending five times as much time with a child, you're gonna drink five times, nobody's sort of saying that. But the point is, is that with a very clever manipulation, right, that we can elicit differences in the kind of environment that the child is gonna assume, uh, uh, experience. It's a very good question. So if I, uh, Bill can correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was something, they were screen, heavy drinkers were screened out and I think abstainers, so the kind of the, the two extreme groups. So kind of like almost everybody else in between, I think was sort of probably what they were trying to sort of go for. So screened out heavy drinkers and of course screened out abstainers because then they're not, they're not gonna drink anything. So it's sort of whoever's left in between there would be sort of presumably who is represented by that. Yeah. But does everybody sort of see how this is a really powerful example, right, of how you can elicit differences in parental behavior, right, by manipulating what's being manipulated here, the child's behavior. And similar with this, or this, this line of work, is a, a really um, important paper by Russ Barkley, I think it was 1988 or maybe the year, year before, in which, and when you medicate using methylphenidate children with ADHD, and then their ADHD kind of behaviors go down, you see reductions in negative parenting behavior. Right? So in other words, you can affect parenting behavior not even doing anything with or to the parents directly, but by simply what? Changing the child's behavior. So if the child's behavior is negative and disruptive and so forth, then you can think about it the other way as far as the pulling for. Does that sort of kind of get at your question as far as, as, far as child effects? Um, one sort of final sort of tongue-in-cheek comment about this, about this article. I remember when I explained this article to my wife, this was like 15 years ago, I think I was in, still in grad school. I said, isn't this like the greatest study? It's so clever and so forth. And she read the article and she's like, yeah, it's good. She's like, but there's a big flaw in it. And I was like, oh, it's a random assignment. Of course, the sample size could always be bigger and so forth. I was like, I don't, I don't think so. And she said, do you know why there's no, uh, why you found gender differences? And I said, no. she's like, it's just beer. She's like, if you had wine, she's like, you got to do a follow-up study, Bill. We'll do that, okay? We can do that. Have wine and not just beer. And I remember I asked Charlotte, and she said it was only beer. So anyways, I was, uh, was there a hand over there somewhere? So child effects, powerful part of your psychoeducation regiment, okay, is to talk about that. Can I address these? Yes, please. When I talk about that series of studies, there's always a parent in the room who raises their hand, and they say, the government paid you. <laughs> exactly. They were all thinking that, Bill. They just didn't actually say. Yeah. And they always say, why didn't you just call me and ask exactly. me if my child drives me to drink? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so exactly. Yes, that's, 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 that's very, very true. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about in this sort of, again, because we're really prioritizing parenting and parent-child relationships and parenting behavior. This is a model developed by Jay Belsky a long time ago, trying to provide some context for understanding so if we're interested in parenting behavior, right, I hope all of you are, if you weren't before, you are now, hopefully, thinking about, well, the basic fundamental question of why do parents parent the way they do? Right? Everybody studies parenting predicts obesity, parenting predicts academic development, but a lot of people don't ask the question of why do parents parent the way they do? Well, you now know one answer to that question is who's being parented, the characteristics of the child, okay? So here's sort of his conceptual model around personality and marital relationships and you know, uh, uh, household responsibilities and, and these kinds of things. Now, I think it's important to sort of put in context caregiving behavior and these sort of naturally occurring individual differences that I'm talking about are really powerful and under sort of really strong conservation. And what I mean by that is that 
Um, these are images from a book by Dario Mastriepi, who studies harsh, sort of abusive parenting in uh, non-human primates, okay, in rhesus macaques, okay. And in his book, he details how in these naturally occurring rhesus macaque colonies, there are, guess what, naturally occurring individual differences in caregiving behavior, including at the extreme end of the distribution, um, uh, moms who engage in what you could only really surmise as being something close to harsh parenting. So they'll drop them from trees, they'll stomp on them, they'll, they'll drag them around and things like that, okay? And so the reason why I bring this here is not to sort of make, to sort of dampen, dampen mood or anything, but that when we think about caregiving behavior, right, that it's sort of necessary for species survival, right? And so we want to think about just how central those instincts are and the factors that influence sort of caregiving behavior in terms of its development. Yeah. Other cultures as well. So you, oh, sorry. Yep. In other cultures, cu cultures as well. So yep. Yep. you have to be, I guess, sensitive to that because you don't want to offend them if that's something that they were raised. You know. Sure, sure, sure. So I think that's absolutely right. You don't want to come up with prescriptions, and I hope you don't leave today's workshop with this idea that there's going to be a formula or an algorithm for determining what the optimum degree of, of, of parenting is or the type of parenting. But I think that's sort of part of the considerations around what we talked about this morning around the so social context, what kind of outcomes are adaptive in that particular context and so forth. And that might sort of, sort of move the needle a little bit, sort of left or right, depending on exactly what interventions you use. But I think the sort of the principles are still the same in terms of we're trying to optimize child functioning, but that itself might differ across these different contexts. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, let me go a couple more slides and then we can uh, take a break because I think we're supposed to break at three o'clock. Um, another facet of why parents parent the way they do, which is relevant to child effects, which is relevant to psychoeducation and relevant to all the kind of specific techniques that we're gonna talk about is executive functioning, right? So defined as cognitive functions that support regulation, okay? And so that involves things like planning and attention, cognitive flexibility and working memory and so forth. And so you need good executive functioning in this child effects context because we all have situations like this. We don't want to be sort of highly reactive. We want to be what? Well regulated in our response to that. Okay. So what do we know about executive functioning aspects and their relationship to parenting behavior? The next slide has an empirical example. So some of you may be familiar with these sort of summary, you know, sort of images. So on the left hand side we have something that's called the color word Stroop test. Okay. So on the left hand side if you look at the first row, okay, and if I ask the group to sort of read across the word, each word for the first row, can you guys go ahead and do that? Okay. Would you guys mind doing that again for the second row please? Okay. For the third row I want you guys to read it, uh, the word but not the color. Okay, same thing, fourth row. Okay, so what the color word Stroop is doing, as you'll see, is that as you move down, the color of the word and the word of the, the sort of syntax of the words did what? They differed, right? So as you go further down, so like one, two, three, four, take the fifth row, you have the word purple, but it's in red. So we call this in executive functioning language sort of interference. You have a cognitive set, you have a general strategy, but interference often happens in life, right? And perhaps for your family, the interference comes in the form of this little guy, or at least that behavior at that time, okay? So we'll come back to that in just a second. So on the right-hand side is basically a variation, a computerized test of version of what's known as the Wisconsin card sorting task, okay? And the Wisconsin card sorting task is a test, uh, well, I'll, you guys can tell me. So let's say that um, you have a, a deck of cards in front of you and I'm going to ask you to sort the card into one of four mutually exclusive piles. So you have a stack of cards, I say flip it, and then you're going to sort this card into one, two, three, or four. And then we're just going to keep going. Okay? So if you look at the card at the bottom, 
Okay? You guys can just sort of say out loud, which of the four piles, one of only four, don't do more than one, four, more than one which pile, one, two, three, or four, would you sort that, this card in? Oh, wait, what? Right? So there's, there's differences. Okay. So for the people who said pile two, what is, you sorted that based on what? Okay. Number three? Okay. And four? Okay. So as the experimenter, as the examiner, you sort, and I don't tell you anything other than yes or no. Okay. So let's say you flip it over and you put it in three and I say yes. You flip it over again and you're going to still use the same sorting rule. You're going to sort by color. So you keep going, but at some point, all of a sudden to you, I say no. So people are like, well, take it and you flip, the, sort it by the same thing and I say no. Okay. So this Wisconsin card sorting test is a test of what's known as cognitive flexibility. Can you change your strategies in response to changing conditions in the environment? Yeah, for a while, you go ahead and sort according to this. And we know there's individual differences in people in terms of once they're told no, how many times they keep, what, sorting with the same rule before you realize, oh, you know what, it's not, doesn't seem like it's color anymore, I'm going to go over here. Okay. So we call that, or we think that re relates to cognitive flexibility. Why does that matter? This will be the last slide, and then we'll take, take a break. Here's a nice paper by Kirby uh, Dieter Deckard, who's at the University of Massachusetts, who looked at how executive functioning in the ways that we just talked about, Wisconsin card sort, uh, digit span, Stroop, these are some other common tests used to assess working memory, cognitive flexibility, set shifting, these kinds of things. And observations of their negative parenting behavior as a function okay, of how disruptive their child was. Okay? And so basically what they found is that parents who were lower on executive functioning, who were less cognitively flexible, who had a harder time with working memory, who had a harder time with the Stroop color word interference test, okay, showed greater increases in their negative parenting in response to negative child behavior. So going back to the child effects example, right? So the differences in this room that we would expect to see in response to dealing with the kid like this was partially dependent on how we performed across these tests. And people who had a harder time with these tests tended to react more negatively, more harshly, more punitively in response to this cute little guy okay, than people who had better performance, okay? And so again, understanding the sort of neurocognitive self-regulation aspects of parenting will help you in terms of sort of framing for parents why parenting behavior is important. So we'll take a break now. When we come back, we're going to sort of get into the actual principles. What do you do in session? What does that look like? And uh, we'll get into it there. What we do for this second half is get into um, much more of the sort of specific kind of considerations, maybe evidence-based practices reflecting these considerations, things that you could do in the room. And again, please um, really want to hear from all of you in your own experience, your own expertise about what you've implemented that works, a slight offshoot of, of uh, some of these principles and, and, and so forth, okay? So it's about 3.30, we'll go for maybe, maybe an hour and then maybe we can uh, call it a day. Um, okay, so when we were talking about behavioral parent training for, uh, for ADHD, we talked before we got into all this, we were talking about the sort of the different modules, right? So the first one being psychoeducation, and again, I tried to provide you some of these different kind of tools or resources in ways that some language, some principles, et cetera, that you can share with uh, your families in that context. So a second kind of foundational element of behavioral parent training is um, bringing parents um, up to speed around principles of positive parent-child interaction, but I also added the word adult because, again, there may be other adults in the household, for example, grandparents or uncles and aunts and so forth, that certainly you wouldn't want to sort of have them sort of interacting in, uh, in, in ways that are clearly uh, different, okay? So what are the kinds of things that people 
enact or sort of try to help parents with in this space of positive parent-child interaction? Well, of course, we're talking about labeled praise, okay? And actually labeled praise, enacting labeled praise is a lot more difficult than it sounds, okay? Um, so in terms of the phenomenon of labeled praise, we're talking about sort of praising in a way that conveys clear expectations and delivers concrete reinforcement. And we know from very, very sort of like microanalytic studies that relative to even sort of general comments of praise, like good job, well done, that label bra labeled praise, excuse me, increases that specific behavior, okay? So examples like good job cleaning up, thank you for sharing with me, I like how you're building so quietly, right? So you want to sort of be as specific as possible. So that's what you're sort of trying to get, trying to get parents to do. And of course, in a very kind of behavioral modeling kind of perspective, oftentimes I find it useful to actually spend some time with the child myself, right? And to model these things for the parent, okay? So you might have a free play opportunity with the child and so forth. You can have the parent in the room and just sort of sitting quietly and watching, watch behind a one-way mirror, whatever you have available to you. I don't think that, that really matters. But to really model for the parent to be as specific as possible in labeling what is the specific behavior that you're praising. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. So I think part of what you want to do in that situation is to try to reframe. Well, that may be true. So I think what you're, what I wouldn't want you to do is necessarily like almost kind of in a like rational, logical way, kind of try to like break apart their contention. I think take that statement for what it is at, like meet them where they are basically and be like, well, going forward, if we can sort of implement this in sort of consistent ways, then we have this opportunity to change. And one way to do that would be after you model it, bless you, uh, uh, for the parent and so forth, then you can switch roles, right? Have the parent do it and sort of actually participate in, himse in it himself or herself, and that tends to be more reinforcing as well. Yeah. Um, so again, more specific is, uh, is, is, is more powerful too. Uh, another aspect of uh, uh, positive parent-child interaction or relationship is positive attending, okay? So what this includes are things such as reflecting and expanding on conversations and sort of nonverbal things. One thing that I found in my own experience in this space is that we often underestimate just how valuable and powerful and reinforcing nonverbal cues are, okay? And that parents will sometimes say or have said to me like, Labeled praise, yeah, it's, it takes a lot of work and sometimes it feels kind of disingenuous and so forth. But again, try to diversify for the parents to, to just a smile, making uh, uh, eye contact, facial expressions and things like that can also be part of how you positively attend that don't require quite as much effort and that also sort of round out the parent's portfolio of things that they can, that they can use. Yeah, question in the back. There's like a, a gradient in regard to labeled praise, particularly when you're thinking about the cultural mindset, the, not just cultural in regards to racial and ethnic, but also familial culture, that that's just not in our language yes. to use that. And yep. so to label the praise or even to be descriptive may not necessarily be, like you mentioned, it might feel disingenuous. Yeah, so I think that can be, you know, certainly a, a, a challenge. What I would sort of um, go back with in that situation is to see if you can't get parental buy-in and actually have it be very task or domain specific, okay? So rather than trying to enact this sort of like all the time across all domains, see if you can get, can't get parent buy-in around a specific, let's say around homework specifically or around chores specifically and start there and see if you can't use that to sort of like kind of build some momentum that way. But I think sort of starting small, keeping it sort of more scalable might sort of help with buy-in. And look, you know, if there's some, Differences in like, you know, we're not going to talk a lot today about daily report cards and, you know, uh, token economy systems and stuff like that. There's uh, a lot of resources available on that. But I've had parents say to me sort of like, why should my get, kid get a reward for cleaning up? I used to have to clean up and then dot, dot, dot. I used to have to walk uphill to school both ways. We've all, <laughs> we've all heard it. I say that to my kids all the time. Um, so part of it is sort of working with the parent a little bit around values, partly kind of reframing sort of incentivizing behaviors and these kinds of things. But it, is, it can be a, a challenge for sure if you have 
a parent because of whatever the family, cult, the, the family context, not even necessarily racial, ethnic, cultural, and so forth. But I think if you can start small and build a little bit of momentum there, that be, might be a, a sort of a way of entree without it being sort of too overwhelming. Yeah, please. Yeah. For, for every approach yes. uh, that's built around that is sort of the idea of a parent as being like a scientist yeah. uh, you know, developing hypotheses and I think when you hit a spot like that even even with culture one of the things that's interesting to throw out there is say, hey, you know, I, I realize this isn't something that you would do naturally out of you know, your tradition and your experience yeah. one of the things I'm going to ask you to do you know, is be blatantly honest, is I'm going to ask you to get out of your comfort zone yeah. every now and then yeah. and try a couple things that are a little different. Yep. And we'll see how they work. Yep. Maybe they'll be helpful. Maybe maybe they won't. What I'm, what I'm asking you to do, though, is not shut it down yeah. right away because, you know, that's not me. Yep. Right? Yep. And I think, I, I think that... It's kind of it comes down to being about trust. Yeah, exactly. And everything is scalable, right? Try it for a while. We're going to evaluate. We're going to assess. And if it's not working, sort of consider why. But I think one of the challenge we often, challenges we often uh, encounter, though, is that if we go back to our cognitive flexibility challenge here, right, that if you have somebody who doesn't have a lot of cognitive flexibility, on average, then some of that's going to get, sort of that vulnerability gets transmitted to the child. So, really so you're, you're going right at that. You're trying to break down. Well, you know, if, you, if, you, if anybody who's into ACT or you know, they talk about psychological flexibility and you know, that's essentially Exactly, and so I think another sort of variant of that is sort of for those of you who are uh, familiar with like motivational interviewing techniques, right? So motivational interview, try to get the person to sort of articulate what are their values, what are they, what are they committed to, what are, you know, what are their goals and so forth. And then what do you kind of gently highlight? Well, you say this, but when we look at what, so you create a little bit of almost a dissonance there, right? And same, maybe perhaps similarly, you could do that here in terms of a parent sort of reluct expressing reluctance maybe being somewhat inflexible and so forth. And maybe the reframe there could be something around, well, we're asking Sally or we're asking Johnny to sort of change his or her routines, to be a bit more flexible about things that they work for. And so you can kind of model that, right? So that, that way it's, we wouldn't really expect, I think it's reasonable to expect that the child do all this flexibility, but not the parent, right? So if there's ways of sort of conveying that or sort of you know, messaging that in a sort of palatable way, then I think that, 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 that could be reasonable. Yes. Would you say something along the lines like, well, that may not be the style of parenting that happened when you grew up, but maybe if we try this, this will actually reinforce the style that you had when you grew up. Yeah, I, 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 if, if, sorry. if these parents see a change in their child after yep. they've existed a certain behavior, yep. then they might actually perceive that the change better reflects the style that they recall. Yeah, I think that's really important in terms of like what I was trying to say before um, around kind of building some momentum, right? And so if they do, if you can get them to sort of commit to sort of in a very circumscribed kind of way and you see significant behavior change that's positive, then I think you can sort of frame it around those kinds of terms in ways that are sort of comfortable and sort of familiar to them. So I would very much agree with that, that kind of approach. Um, it's, it's sort of like the opposite of like, you know, with depression, we know there's kindling theory, right? Sort of once you have a major depressive episode, you sort of, it seems to like incur some kind of vulnerability, of course, to the development of subsequent depressive episodes. And so that's what we're trying to do here with behavioral parent training. It's sort of trying to sort of build in opportunities for success, given the idea that that will sort of continue to persist and then generalize to other domains, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, I'm a child psychologist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like try to have an opportunity to observe the parent, whether it's in the waiting room, yeah. whether it's when they bring in the child for an original assessment or whatever it happens yep. to be. And I make note of all the little tiny positive things I saw yeah. that kind of fall that I know are gonna be falling under that psychoeducational piece. Yep. And I'll say, you know, I, I recall when I observed you getting down on your child's level and speaking directly to him. So I sort of build in that's, that's a little. In other words, I'm already letting them know, hey, you're already there a little yeah. bit. Here's, and I'm just really extending on something you're already doing a little 
that's a wonderful way to sort of frame things, right? You can sort of build in. So then it might, it might not seem like so much of a stretch, right? That it's not qualitatively different than what they've already been doing, but maybe trying to tighten it up and sort of have the implementation be a bit more consistent and so forth. But I mean, there's, you know, we talk about sort of label praise for, for children. Why shouldn't or wouldn't that work for in terms of her parent buy-in and consistency and adherence and things like that? Thank you for sharing that. I really, really like that perspective. Um, so when we're talking about positive attending, and again, this is really something that parents um, need support around um, in terms of like, so for example, a child says, I threw out the trash. The parent says, and it was super heavy too, right? So kind of participate, trying to sort of expand on really that positive attending to what they're doing, okay? Uh, the child says, I'm building a fort. The parent says, and it has two levels and five windows. Really trying to sort of outfit, really, the, the nature of the conversations in more positive and explicit kinds of ways. Another thing that we really try to emphasize in behavioral parent training in this sort of parent-child relationship positive space is, and this is really difficult, is to try to really work at catch your child being on task and positive, okay? And we know that sort of framing that for parents <coughs> helps parents see the fact that their child is actually positive and on task and compliant probably more than they actually see, okay? So it's sort of like priming somebody, right? So if you prime somebody to think about sort of like with people with anxiety around contamination fears, you prime them, oh, you're gonna go travel on an airplane in the winter time? Wow. <laughs> when you're primed like that, guess what you see? You see all the people sneezing and blowing their nose, right? You see it once you're primed. So what we're trying to do here is to prime the parents around, let's make it really effortful, okay? Very behavioral in terms of trying to catch your child being on task and positive, we often advocate something like a five to one ratio, okay? A sort of positive versus sort of critical or sort of negative kinds of comments. Try it with your own kids, it's pretty hard. Um, uh, but that's something to sort, of, to sort of keep in mind, okay? And the, the, this is an opportunity, five to one, my, there's no way. You know, so you wanna normalize that it's difficult, right? So another reframe that I do here is that if a parent is sort of incredulous five to one, that's you know, like literally physically impossible, then one slight reframe on that would be like, well, let's sort of construct the learning and the family and the home environments and activities in ways that give your child, what? The most opportunity to be on task. So let's make, it's like almost like stack the deck a little bit in their favors. In the beginning, that's oftentimes what you do. You set the bar pretty low, right? To sort of build in the task demands are pretty low so that you have a much better chance of getting to that five to one versus sort of like, I have a couple slides coming up around high stakes environments. Like, you know, high stakes environments, if you're predominantly in that kind of context, then yeah, five to one might be hard to, hard to, to, to achieve, yeah. Yes, right. Correct, exactly. So if you just see the child lift the pencil, but he wasn't lifting the pencil to begin with, that's, you know, getting toward the goal of completing that question. Totally agree. I think that's part of the framing the expectations, right? That, like, we might not be able to get him or her doing all their math homework in one sitting tomorrow, you know, that kind of, but sort of building sort of up to that. And sort of somewhat related to that, I think as the clinician, parents will oftentimes need help actually identifying behaviors that they maybe with your help can kind of, okay, I guess I see that as being positive, but they sort of take that for granted or they don't necessarily sort of see that because their expectations are that well, they should be doing that anyways. Yeah. So on the five to one ratio, it, it, how would you label the one? Is it a negative comment, a critical comment? What's the yeah, one? I think it's sort of a corrective slash negative comment, something in, in that space would sort of be the one and the five would ideally be sort of praise and of course specifically labeled praise, yeah. Yeah, what is, exactly. Uh -huh. Is um, I talk about Gottman's research mm -hmm. with couples. Yep. And the ones that divorced went below the ratio. Yep. And then I talk about how parenting your child's in a relationship too. I mean, they can't divorce you. Yes. <laughs> but you know, you don't want them to, and so getting this ratio. So I kind of like, and when I frame it that way, people yeah. will respond. They're interested in that. It, it is parent-child relationships is just another example of other social relationships we have. And there's similarities and there's differences, of course. But I think it's not as simple as simply sort of helping parents be aware of it and, and then that's all they need. But I do think helping parents be 
aware of it and sort of helping frame for them the fact that it is difficult and it is effortful, especially in the beginning, but then helping them sort of identify like, well, I never really considered that behavior a positive behavior. Well, then there's, then you might have sort of more in their wheelhouse with respect to uh, observe and to praise. Yep. Yes, that's right. So I know you're trying to catch them being good and accentuate everything that's positive. That's right. And I know that will expect. Yes. But if you give them a negative consequence, you know, whatever. Yes. Behavior, where does that fall? And is that something we talk to parents about? Yeah, absolutely. So if we had more time, we could talk about the development of a daily report card and consequences and you know, token economies and these kinds of things and so forth. And I wouldn't consider that really, I mean, maybe it's sort of part of the number, you know, the one in the... In the, in the five to one, but I, I would almost consider that a little bit sort of separately. As long as the consequence is clearly known and stated, and we're going to talk in a little bit about how clarity of communication and the expectations is really, really important. And so to me, I'm less concerned about the frequency of negative consequences and so forth. Look, if the child does uh, stated behavior that you've outlined as one of the three or four things that is supposed to be accompanied by a consequence, I think what we know from the literature is that where parents can get into a little bit of trouble and where clinicians that we need to sort of support them in is parents sometimes don't let the consequences do the work. They'll do the consequences plus they'll do a lot of like hand waving and talking and sort of like, see, I told you. Just let the consequences do its job, right? Do their, their, do their job, right? do their job, exactly. But I might sort of put that sort of nearby the five to one, but sort of ultimately separable. As long as we're talking about the kind of clearly like, look, if it's hitting, you know, physical aggression is one of those behaviors, um, talking, uh, whatever, you know, like whatever, whatever the other sort of three or four or two or three negative behaviors are, as long as those are clearly laid out and the child's aware that those are gonna be accompanied by these consequences, let that system do its job and you don't need to sort of do all the hand waving and pontificating around like, you know, all, let the system do its job. Yeah, did you have a question? Yeah. I, I, I struggle with asking or not, but yes. I know you addressed earlier. The parents are different. I'm thinking one particular family of mine. Yeah. The mom wants to change. Yes. It's hard for her. Yes. They're trying to move away from physical punishment. Yes. Something like this. Great. The father is uh, an alcoholic. Yeah. And so it's hard for them to both be on the same page. Yes. So Yes. If there's any way to get the parent, um, you said it was the father, right? Yeah, the father in. Um, in yes. 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 Sure. Sure. I mean, this might be an example of a perfect example, but of what we were talking about uh, before with respect to parent psychopathology, parental self-care, like maybe providing some support around dad getting some treatment for, unless he's... He's like, mm -hmm. no. this therapy's not about me. And I'm fine, I'm perfectly fine. You're perfectly fine, yeah. The whole perfectly yeah, fine, right? right. He's, he's fine. Yeah. Like, and it's even harder like, to, to, to say, but... So I, is, is there a way for you to... Um, what would the word be? Either, as well, how's the child doing in general? Let's, let's, let's start there. She's doing okay. She's, doing okay. she's, she's definitely ODD. Yeah. She's eight years old. Yeah. And then the, it's the same mom that I, that, that I said earlier that she's yeah. That's how she's here. Yes. You know, I'm home. She's negative expectations about her to begin with. Yes. And so uh, the, she's okay. She's yeah. not terrible, but she does lie. She's yeah. Lying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think sort of if there's a way to sort of build in some incentives for dad's participation, either more participation in treatment or his own self-care, is if there's um, any evidence of her sort of perhaps, I think if you could introduce almost like some violations of their expectations, right, around she's doing better than they thought she did, then you could sort of start to refer to those behaviors as sort of behavioral goals that can become more sort of generalized, right? So I'm gonna make something up. So let's say at soccer she's not only not defiant, she's actually pro-social and some of these other kinds of things. And so if there's a way to then sort of buy, get buy-in from the parents, like, look, 
clearly she's capable of being not just not defiant, but being sort of prosocial and adaptive. If there was a way to sort of expand that, that might come about if there was sort of greater involvement, greater adherence, and things like that. But parent psychopathology, especially if they're not aware of or deny the problems, is, 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 is certainly a, a, a big challenge. But it sounds like, sorry, you were going to say something? No, I'm thinking it is a barrier. Like yeah. For me, it's like a, like a barrier that I'm yeah. able to Yeah. Fire, yep. Because, like I said, in session, yeah. the dad is better. Yeah. Like, yeah. We do play, like, yep. We talk about PCIT in just a second. Uh -huh. That's amazing. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Like, yes. But at home, there's no like structure. Yeah. So you, it, that may benefit from things like um, doing like um, a booster session or like a call in between between sessions and so forth to find out sort of you know what I'm saying like so not just wait till. They come in every Tuesday sort of to do a, uh, maybe you do a little bit of a planning session on Friday before heading into the weekend around what the activities are and so forth to sort of help sort of build in some better sort of fidelity basically to some of those kinds of principles and so forth. But that's not uncommon where you sort of, sort of see kind of good sort of buy-in sort of in session, but it's sort of the implementation part. And I think if you can do some follow-up sessions in Skype or on the phone sort of in between your face-to-face -face time with them, that might give you some traction as well. Yeah. Stressors. Kind of stress mm -hmm. doing, yeah. Or having, yeah. You know, that affects children. Yes. Get him to talk about the things that he doesn't like and what's not going well for him. And mm -hmm. He never has time for himself or whatever. Yeah. And then encourage that self care part that you're talking yeah. about. Why don't you try to get to the gym mm -hmm. once a week? Why don't you call your yeah. buddies and, yep. you know, go play hockey or yes. something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And That's just do it like more in that way where maybe the dad will become a little happier. I know that doesn't make alcoholism go away, but maybe if he's a little happier, he would be a little more willing to support her. Right, no, I think that's a great example around, it's, it's a good example of modeling for the parents some perspectives around problem solving, right? So fine, maybe dad doesn't think of it as a problem and so forth, right? But who would say it's sort of like, oh, like they don't have stressors and so forth. So you can frame it around that. I really like, sort of like that. And then sort of try to identify what are some actionable targets, right? So like, oh, I don't have, you know, I get to see people as much as I used to, then like, then you can get into that almost behavioral activation mode yeah. and be like, so who are the key people in your life who do give you social support? Like, who are they? Well, let's schedule a time for you to reach out to them and then you can sort of start building some of that and see if that doesn't help with some of the, the engaging or the buy-in or maybe reducing alcohol use and some of these kinds of things. I like that perspective a lot. Thank you. Um, okay. So um, the third kind of uh, principle in behavioral parent training is um, sort of what I call kind of triaging problem behaviors, okay? So this is oftentimes a very um, important part of um, framing expectations, um, helping parents define the boundaries of what are sort of actual problem behaviors um, versus sort of behaviors that are just irritating. So I was just talking with one of you at the break that the triage term comes from obviously medicine, right? So if you're in an emergency room and somebody you come in with a let's say a multi-vehicle car accident and so forth, chances are the person who's in front of you might have a number of injuries. But some, part, some injuries are gonna be more acute than others, right? So same thing with problem behaviors. When you oftentimes meet with families in the beginning, they're gonna give you a sort of like, uh, it's like one of those King Arthur scrolls of lists of behavior problems and so forth. You're gonna sort of have to provide a bit of a frame for them around them. And one way to do that is to sort of have uh, an, an, an open conversation with the parents around, 
okay, what of your, you know, of your sort of two dozen behaviors that you've talked about here that your child engages that are negative, which ones are actually just irritating versus behaviors that are actually problematic and impairing, okay? And sort of, you need to sort of have a triage here. In the medical example, the behaviors that are sort of impairing, those are the things that should be, the, the, should constitute your focus in treatment, okay? My child talks to me so disrespectfully and, you know, he's just like his dad or, you know, these kinds of things. Those things might have to be sort of the irritating, sort of, but they're lower sort of priority targets, okay? So help parents develop a hierarchy or a triage around not all problem behaviors are created equally for your child in terms of what should be the, the highest uh, intervention targets, okay? You wanna teach and practice and model selective ignoring of ne negative behavior. So once you populated this sort of crude list of sort of like high priority targets that are sort of attention seeking slash disruptive slash impairing versus sort of more irritating, well, those irritating behaviors, now you have a list of three or four or five behaviors that we agree aren't particularly pleasant. They're more irritating, but for now, we're not gonna sort of reinforce those. And so we're gonna sort of ignore them sort of selectively, okay? And so I do this a lot in terms of doing in vivo feedback for parents during an interaction with their child, right? Maybe you model it for them first, right? I've even done it where I'll model for the parent a situation of interacting with their child, and I sort of actually rig it where it's actually gonna pull for those irritating behaviors, right? So I might have them um, do a puzzle with me and say, hey, if we do a puzzle in the next three minutes, um, you can get a, a snack or a reward. We'll talk about it with your parents with, with, with what you get. And then I'll actually take one or two puzzle pieces and I'll leave them out, <laughs> right? So I'm stacking the deck against me, right? Like rigging it against me, right? But again, trying to model for them, right? Which behaviors are irritating, which behaviors are truly sort of problematic. Okay, model for them, switch roles, provide feedback, and so forth. Um, as we mentioned before, behaviors previously reinforced, you know, from parental attention, let's say, are gonna get worse before they get better. So you know those behaviors you used to sort of pay attention to that are irritating? Those irritating behaviors are probably gonna get worse before they get better. You wanna make sure that the parent sort of understands that and anticipates that. Fourth, you wanna emphasize the consistency of selective ignoring and the unintended consequences if you start doing that variably, right? We talked about that before. It's gonna sort of contribute to escalating negative behaviors, okay? And if you're gonna sort of help develop this sort of contingency around sort of selective ignoring, okay? Parents will oftentimes need support about how to do selective ignoring. So it's not as easy as, as, easy as saying it so makes it so, right? So imagine you're a parent, or if you're a parent yourself, you have a, a sort of a negative behavior, or a tantrum, or, or, or something like that, and you just tell the parent, you just need to ignore it, okay? Sometimes they're gonna need more specific direction about that, so I'll sort of say, what is your favorite spot in your house, right? Go there, and be there, and sort of physically remove yourself, et cetera. So help parents have a plan around how to selectively ignore, not just sort of say, hey, you just need to selectively ignore, okay? Um, okay. All right. If we move now to another sort of like name brand sort of intervention, the Triple P Positive Parenting Program, let's look at, again, some of these elements in the Triple P Positive Parenting Program that resonates with some of what we've been talking about before or to date with behavioral parent training. So for those of you who might not be familiar with the Triple P uh, Positive Parenting Program, it's a multi-level system of parenting interventions, and I think there's like five tiers to it. Like tier one is communications, and two is health promotion, and there's, it has a long range of sort of, uh, or a large range of um, sort of levels, especially for like schools and things like that, okay? It's transdiagnostic, so if you look at the, uh, the intervention evidence on its efficacy for Triple P Positive Parenting, it's not just for ADHD, but also social, emotional, and behavioral domains, which is, again, really important for ADHD since we know it has these relationships with these other domains of functioning. And again, there's really strong evidence uh, that, it's, uh, that it yields both clinically and statistically significant effects. So we really sort of like what Triple P brings to the table, okay? So let's look at some of these uh, kind of key principles, and then we'll sort of get into some of the actual um, techniques that are in, this, in, in the service of these goals. 
So the first thing for in, in positive parenting in Triple P is to sort of emphasize the, ne the necessity and the need for a safe and engaging environment. This is usually not that difficult to convey, right? But that we're really committed to supporting the child's healthy exploration, playing, learning, and things like that. Okay. The second element of Triple P is focusing on the positive aspects of a learning environment. This is sort of what I was mentioning before about sort of socializing the parent around being you know, uh, his or her first teacher, right? Teaching parents to respond positively and constructively to child-led activities. We were talking about that before in terms of um, sort of building sort of positive parent-child relationships uh, and so forth, okay? So a positive learning environment is giving them the best chance to sort of be successful, right? So selecting activities, you know, when you do sort of, for example, homework is not ideally late at night with the TV on with all these distractions. Give, have the physical space, for example, okay? That's something that we work with parents a lot around the learning environment is sort of how is that constructed? How is that taking place? And sort of making some modifications there. Three, assertive and consistent discipline, okay? So we want to sort of provide families, let's say using uh, uh, consequences and things like that, alternatives to coercion or physical punishment or physical management strategies, and an emphasis on consistency and uh, predictable consequences. So when we talk about emphasis on consistency and predictable consequences, I sometimes take it to a really far degree in terms of, uh, uh, of clarity in the sense that of having um, the points or whatever you're using as the reward system and consequences, having those printed up and placed on walls, put it on top of the refrigerator or, or outside the refrigerator, having them in public sort of, sort of high sort of, you know, activity areas and so that you can always sort of refer back to those kinds of uh, 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 messages, okay? Um, four, realistic expectations, okay? I think it's important um, that you think about what are the parents' assumptions, we talked about this before, beliefs about change and causes of behavior and choosing appropriate goals. And parental self-care, as we've mentioned before. And so parental self-care, I think part of that is, you know, the parents are, you know, sometimes will need help around um, resourcefulness. So as the comment came up earlier, right, providing some support about like, oh yeah, you know, I used to play hockey with my buddies before, but I don't anymore, right? So they're gonna need potentially some support about how to sort of reignite that in terms of the, kind of a behavioral activation kind of approach, okay? Um, let me see if that's in the next slide or not. Okay, um, in terms of realistic expectations and assertive and consistent discipline, in terms of about the clarity and communication and these kinds of things, um, one of, you know, it's when I look back on my sort of uh, career to date, I think if I had to pick one intervention that was the most sort of transformative for a family was a, a parent and an adolescent with ADHD and kind of some oppositional defiant disorder kinds of, kinds of problems. And they used to get into these really kind of protracted exchanges, or, you know, coercive and escalations and, and these kinds of things, a lot of affect involved. It was specifically around the child cleaning his room, okay? So not uncommon, but it, it often sort of metastasized into these huge exchanges. Sometimes it got physical and so it was, it was a real problem. But when we're talking about being assertive and consistent and clear and expectations and these kinds of things, so the, the intervention that I suggested to the parent was, I said, why don't you go into your, your son's room and I want you to clean the room, his room, in the way that you expect. Clean it for him, right? Because she would say like, oh, you know, uh, Johnny, you didn't clean your room. And he's like, no, I did. She's like, no, there's still stuff. So then that, that would sort of be the kind of catalyst to the coercion and to the conflict, okay? So I said, why don't you go into the room, clean the room the way that you think is reasonable, okay, and what you would expect, and then take a picture of it. Take a picture of the room and blow it up. And she, she showed me a picture of it. She printed it, it might have been like the size of that, that poster, <laughs> that pinup board there, it was huge. <laughs> and what do you think she did with that picture? She put it up right outside his room, like if this was the front door, it was like right here. And so then the son, she's like, don't forget, you know, you gotta clean up your room. And then I, I, okay, mom, I did the room. And she comes by and checks. She doesn't even have to say anything. All she does is what? Point at the picture. 
So I'm not saying like that's like a, the greatest intervention ever, but it's an example of clarity and specificity and disengaging from conflict, right? So we're trying to prevent the onset of fighting about the thing in a way that's sort of unambiguous. What's more, and so she said, I remember, that uh, he'd be like, okay, mom, I clean the room and stuff. And sh she would, she developed this sort of habit of like, he had some socks on the floor. And so she would point to the socks and then do what? Point to the picture. And she, but she doesn't have to talk, right? And so I think that kind of like, explicit sort of like unambiguous you can't do it for everything but for certain specific things because we identified the clean room as being not so much a huge deal in and of itself but because it sort of tended to spark these more coercive exchanges yeah Did you say the age? Uh, he was like 14 or, or, or something like that yeah so again you can sort of mess with that sort of principle in a way that's sort of developmentally appropriate for a younger child or for an older child. But the idea of clear, unambiguous, like trying to help families diffuse, sort of like, you know, families start marching towards the inevitable, sort of like, you know, that kind of thing. If you can kind of diffuse that in some ways, in explicit ways, that will sort of help with some of what we're talking about. Yes. It, it could, but I think what's, I think the, the, the way that we, that, that we, that I would think about it would be that the child, and in this case, the, the, the teenager also reported, you know, they don't like having these protracted conflicts either and so forth. And there is some initial begrudging, if that's the word, in the beginning, maybe some, some semi-resentment toward the parent around, around that kind of thing. And eventually, the picture came off the wall. So it's not meant to sort of be coercive or sort of like shaming or anything like that. But the point is in that for both the parent and the child, I think it hopefully communicated to them for conflict areas or topics, there should be a level of clarity around what the expectations are um, that will help sort of diffuse sort of the development of these kinds of more conflictual kinds of things. Around expectations and communication and so forth, another example of, of, uh, of, of, of how I do this work with parents is that when they, when related to like learning environments or sort of what I call with families, I, I call it high stakes environments. So helping the parents sort of develop a framework for anticipating and understanding sort of kind of threats to sort of uh, the, the child's behavior. And so the two examples I use a lot with families is that as a parent of a 10 year old and a two year old, especially my two year old, um, there are two settings to me that are literally the most high stakes environments for parents, okay? Uh, the second one, and it's in this order in my opinion, the second one is an airport, right? So many distractions, novelty, you need to pay attention, stay in line, and all these kinds of things. So leading up to that, if you know you're gonna take your child to an airport, right? There should be consistency and clarity around what? What are the expectations? What are the rewards available? State one or two consequences that if you do this or when this, then this kind of thing. We have a slide coming up on little sort of mnemonic devices or little sort of like language word choices that can really sort of help in clarity. And then the first most high stakes environment that I can think of for parents is Costco. Okay? <laughs> Costco is literally like a war zone for parents in terms of young kids, disruptive, impulsive, whatever, right? It's large, there's people that they could lose them easily, there's things to touch and climb on and so forth. So I use those two examples to parents to be like, look, if you know, right, that there's gonna be a learning or a social environment forthcoming, that's gonna be a challenge, that might, you know, you present some of these things, that puts a premium on what? What are the expectations? What is it? What are the consequences? You know, that's maybe when you sort of get down to their eye level and really kind of make sure, to the best of your ability, that they are sort of understanding what's at stake, okay? And again, it's not that there's anything holy about Costco and the airport, although I do think Costco and the airport are really high stakes. But whatever those high stakes moments are, I think the parents sort of should begin to develop, right, a kind of um, a mindset around sort of how to sort of help the child succeed in the most positive way in a sort of anticipation kind of way, yeah. 
Go back a little bit. So in regard to identifying a hierarchy of behaviors as well as identifying ideal, like pro-social behaviors, yep. sometimes parents kind of compartmentalized, right? Or they, you know, talk about the constellation of symptoms as one thing, yes. right? And so how far down do you go um, in helping them break it down? Like for instance, like typically with my families, it's, I want them to just get ready for bed, yeah. right? And, but we recognize that there are multiple steps yeah. to just getting ready for bed and yes. how much flexibility you have. Similarly, or conversely, they'd say, well, I just want you to deal with their tantrum behaviors. Yeah. And then I understanding that there's actually multiple smaller behaviors within that tantrum episode. That's right. Um, and so, it, you know, there's an aspect of ignoring, but then it ends up being an antecedent to leading up to something else. Yeah, so I think the ignoring, selective ignoring, should be tied to pre, agreed upon, broken down sort of behaviors, okay? So it should be sort of, so there shouldn't be any ambiguity ideally for the parents about what specific behaviors they should be ignoring, okay? Rather than things like in the bedtime because then maybe it's avoidant and then you have some of these uh, other problems. But take the uh, example you gave of sort of getting ready for bed. When I think about sort of target behaviors and sort of negative behaviors for something like say around the time of, of getting uh, ready for bed, I think you're right, you wanna sort of break those down into sort of individual components. And especially in the beginning, perhaps, when you're trying to sort of build some momentum, one of the big things that can derail, you know, reward, token economy, you know, daily report kind, cards kinds of things, is that the, pa the parent sort of unintentionally identifies behaviors or like the operationalized three or five times in an hour or whatever, bars that are too high. So what I generally encourage parents doing in the beginning around reward and things like that is to identify a couple of easy behaviors that they're sort of likely to meet. You're trying to sort of kindle some success here, right? The last thing you want to do is to have behaviors that are so difficult to meet or levels that are so high that they're always on level one or level two out of 10 or, or whatever, whatever the case might be. But I think breaking apart those steps is part of that sort of semi-socialization around being a scientist, coming up with behaviors. What are the specific behaviors? Helping them understand what might precipitate those behaviors. And, and if you can model that for them, then I think over time, hopefully the idea is that the parent can also sort of break apart sort of problem areas. Let's say it's about you know, getting ready in the morning you know, or getting, you know, going to soccer or these kinds of things. If you can break it down into individual steps, I think that gives you a better chance around clarity. And remember, although I'm not sure if I talked about it explicitly, one of the other tasks in this study, again, this is sort of the parents' executive functioning and their responsiveness to negative child behavior with more negative parenting. This uh, task here is called the Tower of Hanoi, if any of you are familiar with it, but it's basically, um, it's an executive functioning task where you have like three poles, right? You can think of them almost like three chopsticks sort of sticking up. And you have these discs or these dials that sort of sit on them. And so you ask the person like, I want you to make your thing here, the same as mine, but there are certain rules, right? You can only move one dial over one stick at a time, and you can never have a bigger disc on top of a smaller disc, and so that activity is a measure of planning, okay? And so when you start working with families around planning for routines and planning for contingencies and so forth, Oftentimes, parents of kids with ADHD will have some executive dysfunction themselves, and so sort of helping them sort of break things down. So when you sort of say, we need to plan for our trip, for a lot of people, they can sort of like break things down sort of into these sort of modular pieces, but these families might need much more specific direction around them, around those things, and helping identify some of those behaviors that might be more reward-worthy versus those that might be more um, subject to consequences if they're negative. Um, okay, so other sort of core parenting sort of skills, we've talked about parent-child relationship, sort of positive aspects and, and, and enhancement. So spending brief quality time, showing affection, again, really sort of ha having that sort of ideally develop into sort of almost like a habit for, for, for parents is important. Um, how to support parents around encouraging desirable behavior. So again, giving specific praise, giving uh, uh, descriptions that are sort of in support of that, nonverbal positive kinds of things as well, and providing appropriate engaging kinds of activities. So that's an important one, okay, in terms of almost like this high stakes environment kind of example where <sighs> helping parents develop strategies and contingencies where children actually have an option to be successful, right? So for example, 
I remember working with a family once and um, the parent would often have to go to these appointments and they'd have to wait there for about 30 minutes and there wasn't much for the sort of the child to do and the parent would complain a lot that, that he would become disruptive and these kinds of things. Part of this executive functioning and planning and so forth is helping parents realize, okay, what are the settings and what are the circumstances in which these negative behaviors are happening? Can we sort of troubleshoot and come up with appropriate engaging activities to keep the child engaged in a pro-social and positive kind of way? Okay, so it's almost like helping parents sort of help kind of diagnose those situations that are most problematic for them, breaking them apart, troubleshooting, providing alternatives, and, and essentially those kinds of activities are what, what we're really trying to, to, to target. Um, teaching new skills and behavior, so modeling appropriate behavior, okay, for them. So I would do that sort of in vivo. So in session, I'll actually have a family do, or a parent and child do a task together, maybe stack the decks a little bit to pull for frustration or these kinds of things. Model it uh, uh, in your own interactions with the child, okay, would be important. Um, using incidental teaching, which means basically creating appropriate learning environments, right? So creating either the physical space or incentives or rewards or activities that are appropriate to sort of help with learning, okay? Using behavior charts and reward systems, certainly a lot of uh, 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 a central part of most behavioral interventions for, for child ADHD. Some considerations about managing misbehavior. So establishing ground rules, right? So this is sort of a really important sort of activity, but it's one that's sort of fraught with a lot of almost like danger in some ways, okay? Because I think when you talk about ground rules, for a lot of parents that means sort of setting up so many rules, right, of equal importance that it can feel a bit sort of constraining. So when you talk about ground rules with parents, sort of like you do with problem behaviors in the triage example, right, you want to sort of have as few ground rules as possible, but that cover as much of the space of the parent-child relationship and the child's functioning as possible, okay? So um, establishing ground rules, parents will often say something like, um, you know, one of the ground rules is just that there's uh, no talking back in my family. Well, especially for an adolescent, I don't know if that's biologically possible for adolescents to not, to not talk back. So maybe then you unpack that a little bit. Are there specific topics around the sort of talking back that are more sort of you know, activating for you and, 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 and these kinds of things? Um, and sort of, again, you, putting some boundaries around these sort of large scale sort of values-based things and so forth rewards, we don't do that in my family, and so forth. It's sort of trying to break apart, start small, and see if you can't build some success that way. We talked about selective ignoring, and again, giving instructions uh, clearly and calmly before you go into Costco, for example. Anticipation and planning, right? Discussing ground rules for specific situations, okay? So, especially for really, um, like I remember one family, uh, we were discussing ground rules for, um, an upcoming birthday party for the child and so forth. And the birthday party was fraught with lots of opportunities for all kinds of impulsivity, irritability, you know, you know non-compliance kinds of things. So we discussed to uh, help parents anticipate, are there things coming up, activities and so forth, that they would benefit from really kind of careful planning around rewards and consequences and things like that. Selecting appropriate activities, right? And who is a part of those activities. Help the parents sort of scaffold and think about are there certain children who tend to, tend to be a bit more provocative? Are there certain activities, maybe it has to be a balance between indoor and outdoor time? These kinds of considerations should help you help the parent anticipate and plan and execute things in ways that can support the child's um, development. Self-regulation is another one of these really kind of key considerations, right? So, sort of parent as scientist, parent as technician, parent as evaluator, right? That should also uh, uh, apply to them as well, right? So helping parents understand what are the cues and triggers for their child's negative behavior, but also for their own, right? So think back to the child effects in terms of what's, what, are, what are the parent's specific triggers around that. Setting developmentally appropriate goals that can be, you know, framed around like, again, a child never I don't want him to talk back to me at all. For an adolescent, you may have to sort of calibrate that a little bit. 
and practicing sort of regulation, okay? So creating opportunities that you can model for the parent and model for the child potentially around their own sort of self-regulation. Um, okay, so when we talk about self-regulation, I think for me, if there was one thing that I could just sort of give to parents who are dealing with children with disruptive behavior problems and ADHD, it would be this thing called self-regulation, okay? And while I'm at it, I would also give some to the kid as well, if I'm just, you know, if, it, if it's freely available, okay? So, so but let's talk about what self-regulation is, okay? So to me, self-regulation, this should be sort of the orienting kind of thing of what you're doing with triple P positive parenting or behavioral parenting. This is what you're trying to enhance, okay? Self-sufficiency in the parents, right? Eventually, as we do with, you know, our, with children and so forth, you want to be able to sort of pull back from a lot of these interventions and you want parents not to just sort of blindly sort of implement them, okay? You ideally want that knowledge to generalize, right? And that it becomes a skill that they're able, available to use, okay? So a lot of this work should be about supporting parents becoming an independent problem solver. So if a parent comes to you with a new set of considerations and so forth, I would sometimes reflect back to them, well, what do you think is going on? What do you think some of the triggers are, right? What are, can you think of different ways to reconfigure the learning environment, right? Thinking about rewards, change up the reward system, these kinds of things, okay? <clears throat> In a similar space, even though people often think of it as sort of being a little bit sort of outside of self-sufficiency, is helping parents sort of know how to seek support. Who are, who are their go-to so sources of social support? making sure that those people, those ways of reaching those people, those ways of sort of accessing that social support is clear and, and unambiguous. The second sort of piece or model of self-regulation in the parent that we're sort of trying to enact with all these different interventions and skills and modeling and so forth is positive expectations about change and problem solving and increasing their sense of agency, okay? So, a lot of times when families first come to you and come to me, they don't have really any expectations about change. Maybe they've been in treatment before, it didn't work, it got worse, right? He's always been like this, she's, this is the worst she's ever been and I've tried a lot of these different kinds of things, right? So what we're trying to do is increase through these interventions, helping parents develop more positive expectations about change. And maybe that just means change in one very specific behavior only in only at home. We're not even going to worry about school yet, or we're not even going to worry about the classroom yet, okay? But we're trying to march towards parents developing more positive expectations about change. Their ability to define the scope of the problem. There's evidence suggesting that when parents describe their children's negative behavior, right, it tends to sort of expand beyond what the actual problem behaviors are. Okay, so part of what we're trying to do is to sort of define that clearly and in a way that they too over time can sort of solve and sort of outline what the boundaries of the problems, specific behavior problems are. And with that, you would hope and expect that they're gonna develop greater agency about how to troubleshoot. This is not working. Okay, this doesn't mean that, you know, uh, daily report cards aren't effective. What it means is that we need to think a little bit about sort of, you know, coming up with a new reinforcer, about how we implement it, and these kinds of things. And then we also are sort of trying to touch upon and improve self-management, okay? So self-management being sort of their sense of self and their assessment of others, including their child, of course. Selection of parenting strategies and evaluating their impact, okay? So helping parents sort of develop a kind of mindset around and what are the antecedents? What are the behavior? What are the consequences, right? How do I need to reconstitute the learning environment, right? Um, how am I communicating expectations and so forth? Am I differentially reinforcing positive and negative behaviors in the child? And sort of how to sort of evaluate that sort of over time. Okay, um, how are we doing on time? Just fast forward and see how many more. Okay, a couple more. Okay. Um, okay. So when we talk about self-regulation, sort of one of the derivative pieces of that is sort of emotion dysregulation in ADHD, okay? So we know that emotional difficulties, broadly defined, irritability, anger, low distress tolerance, 
frequently accompany ADHD. And in fact, there's evidence, there's a paper a while back estimating that 70% of kids with ADHD have some kind of emotional difficulty even without formal depression, anxiety, or ODD, or these kinds of things. And experts in the field, like Russ Barkley, would sort of argue that, in fact, emotion dysregulation might even partially define ADHD, not just sort of be like a sort of adjacent neighbor, but actually be part of the, the dysfunction. We also know that emotional difficulties uniquely explain outcomes, impairment, and predict worse treatment response. So beyond the 18 symptoms of ADHD, these sort of emotional difficulties, difficulties with emotion dysregulation, predict the kinds of outcome differences that we were talking about this, this morning. So when we talk about the term emotion regulation or emotion dysregulation, okay, it has two pieces to it. Okay? It may involve the processes prior to explicit onset of emotion. right? So before you become upset, what happened? What were the precipitating factors? And then emotion regulation are the strategies that somebody uses to sort of retain or uh, resume emotional equilibrium. Okay? So when we think about the sort of precursors to sort of like the onset of negative emotion, a lot of that comes from the literature on distress tolerance. Okay? So from an intervention perspective, I think part of what we're trying to do with children and with parents is to increase their ability to tolerate distress. It's sort of perhaps similar to what we know about like in the anxiety disorders literature. One of the strong risk factors for the development of anxiety is known as uncertainty tolerance. Right? So people who have a hard time when the answer is I'm not sure, we'll figure it out later, or it could be A or it could be P, B, people who have a hard time with that are at elevated risk for anxiety disorders because then it pulls for what? Worries and compulsions and things like that. Okay? So if you think about distress tolerance, right, that probably corresponds to what we were talking about this morning when I gave the example of emotion dysregulation and sort of seasickness. So distress tolerance is sort of each person's respective kind of tipping point with respect to experiencing negative affect. Okay? So what we can do in our interventions is to try to support that by also developing some self-regulation techniques, which we'll talk about in just a second. Okay, so let's talk for a moment about distress tolerance as an intervention target. So when I talk about distress tolerance, I'm talking about the front end of the process, right? Before you actually become seasick, emotionally, okay? So low distress tolerance may accelerate the experience of anger, right? So if you get sort of seasick sort of more readily, right? It's gonna accelerate how quickly you become angry or how quickly do you become seasick. And one thing that's really important in the context of ADHD around distress tolerance is this concept known as delay aversion, okay? So delay aversion refers to a trait that differs in the population in which people differ with respect to when there is delay, delay of reward, delay of knowing or of certainty, there is a strong aversion to that. So how does that sort of reveal itself in the context of emotion regulation, the sort of front, the front end? So we know that there is strong preference for delay aversion, meaning there's a strong dislike of aversion in ADHD. Okay. So when individuals become distressed or on the borderline of becoming distressed, okay, if you have an aversion to delay, what that implies is that for individuals with ADHD, they are going to engage in behaviors that do what to that distress? Get rid of it. So delay aversion is essentially talking about negative reinforcement, right? So negative reinforcement, right, is sort of this idea that it conditions behaviors when you remove an aversive stimuli. Okay. So how does that relate to delay aversion and emotion? So what happens is that if you have a low threshold for delay, meaning you have this delay aversion, which we know is associated with ADHD, when you are distressed, your ability to tolerate that distress for any protracted period of time is somewhat compromised. And so what you're gonna do is you're gonna try to escape this situation, right? And you might do that by, for example, becoming aggressive, okay? 
So becoming aggressive might be a way to manage that distress tolerance. Okay. So when you think about delay aversion in ADHD, that's why we put such a premium on the timeliness of delivering feedback and reinforcements and rewards and consequences for ADHD. Because the delay part is highly consequential. Another important point in terms of distress tolerance is that we think it represents both approach or reward as well as negative reinforcement avoidance factors, right? So generally speaking, what we're saying is that people with ADHD, kids with ADHD, have a preference for immediate reward, like give it to me now, give me that, you know, the, the toy now. But they also have an immediate preference for, as I was just saying, the removal of something aversive, like distress. Okay? So if they're feeling threatened by some other child's comments or words or something like that, instead of being able to tolerate that distress, they may respond aggressively. Okay? So part of what emotion, this sort of front end of emotion regulation is about, is sort of understanding how distress tolerance plays a role in terms of that tipping point and how delay aversion in particular is sort of a threat to that, right? It's just sort of, they, they seek this preference for reward now, or, you know, this distress that I'm experiencing, this anxiety, this uncertainty, this whatever, I want that removed as quickly as possible, right? They have a hard time tolerating that for an extended period of time relative to typically developing populations, okay? Um, okay, just on time here, it's 4.30. So this is my last slide, just to end with some concluding thoughts. So ADHD, again, is sort of really a highly heterogeneous sort of condition, syndrome, especially over time. We've talked a little bit about that this morning and talked a little bit about this this afternoon. And I think when I think about sort of what's analogous to ADHD in terms of a way perhaps that you can share with families or with educators or with other populations is that I think about ADHD in being sort of comparable to something like type 2 diabetes. Okay. Now, for those of you who are somewhat familiar with type 2 diabetes, it's a serious condition, right? Um, are there interventions available to manage type 2 diabetes? Yes, right? What's required to effectively manage, and I say this not as a physician, of course, to effectively manage type 2 diabetes, right? It's multimodal, right? Is it just a pill and you're good? No. no. Diet, lifestyle, nutrition, maybe some support groups, Routine check-ins, monitoring with your physician, right? And as, as needed, you might need, uh, you know, to assess your sugars and all these kinds of things. So if you're able to implement and adhere to those multimodal interventions, people live very effectively with type 2 diabetes, yes? But there's definitely a sort of medium to high bar with respect to management of the condition. Okay? Contrast that to diabetes, type 2 diabetes, let's say, that's not really routinely monitored or assessed or treated, let's look at the natural course of type 2 diabetes, right? It's a risk factor for basically everything, right? Cardiovascular disease, premature death, myocardial infarction, uh, um, uh, uh, diabetic neuropathy and amputation. So if left untreated, it can metastasize in this kind of way. I think there's sort of a conceptual parallel there to ADHD, right? That with these multiple mo multimodal interventions, that, that, that might need to, you might need to do some interventions some of the time and other interventions some of the, uh, at other times. But the point is that it can be managed and circumscribed. Challenging though, right? Checking your sugars all the time is not an easy thing, right? Seeking support, seeking consultation with the physician and these kinds of diet and lifestyle kinds of things. Gosh knows how hard that is, right? But if left untreated, diabetes itself is problematic, but it can catalyze all these other conditions that are really problematic in some of the ways that we talked about this morning. Okay. In your clinical work, your interventions, of course, must be ideographic, meaning it must be individualized. Okay. I can't claim to stand up here and give you prescriptions. You know. We're not at that level yet in terms of being able to sort of you know, develop these algorithms of care yet for, for ADHD or for psychopathology, but I would hope that in your development of these ideographic approaches, individualized for your families and for your clients, they should be organized around these developmental theories and perspectives that we've been talking about, right? So most of what we've been talking about in the, the afternoon workshop are sort of these considerations. So I simply ask that you sort of
consider them and then you can titrate them uh, as appropriate, okay? And that we know from clinical decision making studies, right, that you sort of want to sort of say like, hey, I'm not sure, it's okay to say, I'm not sure what interventions are going to work and how quickly they're going to work. We're going to try things, we're going to evaluate them, we'll sort of reconsider and, you know, sort of, it's, it's sort of this hydraulic. That kind of clinical decision making is parallel to sort of what you want to socialize the parent around, right? There's some general principles, we want to be really mindful of them, but the specific interventions may change, we have to evaluate them and measure them and so forth. Okay? Parenting behavior and parent-child relationships should be assessed and specific fa uh, facets are frontline targets, I would say. Okay? So I would put parenting behavior and parent-child relationships in the ways we've been talking about this afternoon sort of at the top of the list to assess just as much as, if not more, than a medication evaluation. Okay? Especially because we know these aspects have sort of long-term effects, right? Remember back to the study I cited earlier this morning around adolescents who had involved parents, right, helped sort of diminish impairment as those kids transitioned to college, right? So parenting behavior and aspects of the parent-child relationship play a huge role in terms of the kind of unfolding, as it were, of ADHD over time. And that emotional difficulties should be at least monitored, and again, should be part of the treatment consideration. It could be a high-end priority target, or it could be something that's more secondary. But again, emotional difficulties should be um, 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 part of your, your, your treatment plan. Okay, so it's 4.35. I'm going to sort of uh, uh, end here. I'll stick around for a while for any questions that you guys might have. Thank you so much for hanging with me for the last couple hours, and uh, good luck to all of you. Thank you. <laughs>